Well, I am working on a 410 motor again from another 101, HMV 101. This machine was one that I bought from another collector some years ago. Uh, the collector had somebody install a new mainspring in it, common enough. Like I said, I generally do this myself. And no problem there. Whoever did it did put the mainspring in, and it appears to be functional and all of that. No and it was lubricated. They actually used the old-fashioned formula, which is black graphite with uh, Vaseline by the look of it, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. It, it, you know, it works just as good as anything else. There is no right, no wrong, as long as it's lubricated. And you don't overdo it too much. Anyway, that's where the good news ended. Uh, I, I, I find a lot of times when people are unfamiliar with working on these types of motors that they get careless one thing I'm going to tell you right now, when you're working on a motor, any motor from a phonograph, or any motor for that matter, this is the digital age. Digital cameras exist. They're in our cell phones. They're, you know, regular cameras, all kinds of things. You can take thousands of pictures with them. It doesn't cost you anything but the batteries. A little time to load them into your computer if you choose to put them in there. When you take these things apart, take pictures first of everything, every step of the way, everything you do, every washer, every nut and bolt, every little thing so that when it's time to put it back together, you know where everything goes and what's supposed to be there. If you've lost something along the way, some little tiny thing along the way, and you've just missed it, then you'll see, oh, wait, there should be a ball bearing there or something like that. This way you know. Now, this is not a very complicated motor, but if someone has never done one before, it would be. There are more complicated phonograph motors than these. Uh, what did we find with this? All right, this is the... You're, you're a winding gear here, basically. This goes, you know, the spring is attached to this. You see a little end here with a hooked end that a spring goes into. There's your spring barrel. goes right up in there. This end goes, you know, against right in there. Right in there is where it goes. And it rides on the gear that's in here. In the middle of this, you see it's hollow. In the middle of this, there is a shaft. This is the shaft. Shaft goes right down in there. And this spins on the shaft. And this little washer right here would go on the top of the shaft once the spring barrel is on, which is right here. It would be there. Now, in this case, this washer was put at the other end of the spring barrel, where it does not belong, down here. It doesn't belong there. But at least it was there. A lot of times I find this washer just completely missing. Who knows why? But somewhere along the way it disappeared. And these motors will operate without it. But it should be there. You know, HMV did not go to the trouble and expense of putting things like this in there without a good reason. Otherwise, they would have eliminated the financial necessity and, and just gone without it. The other problem was this shaft, which now you see is moving freely, this shaft was completely frozen in there, just like that. Completely frozen in. Would not budge. And it had been that way for a very long time. And whoever did the motor, did the spring, simply missed it. Maybe they didn't realize that's supposed to move, although common sense really should have told them it does. There's a screw here and a screw here, and the two plates of the motor go like that to secure this shaft in place so that only the gear turns on it. Well, one screw was backed almost all the way out. The other one was loose, and I couldn't figure out why until I got it apart. Then I realized they did that. So the whole thing would turn. Eventually, those screws would have fallen out, and, well, that would have come apart. So a little heat later, I got it freed up, discovering along the way that somebody had apparently tried to free it up at some point and slightly mushroomed the edge on one side. So I had to take a small finishing file and just kind of file up the edge, clean it up a little bit so that it will nicely move, no problem. That has to be. That has to be. You, you can't leave it like that. You know, it, it has to be properly moving in there and lubricated. Otherwise, there's going to be problems. All right. The other thing I often find missing, not in this case, though, not in this case, is this tiny little ball bearing there. See it? This is actually the same size ball bearing that goes in the bearing caps on either side here of the governor. Don't take one out of the governor and put it in here if you're missing. The governor needs them. They're there for a reason. It goes in this little cup right here. And a shaft rides on top of that. Your, where is it? There it is. 
you know, you would have a shaft right, well, it would be this shaft, but I'm just using this as an example. The shaft rise on top of it, on top of that bearing, that's your ball bearing. Because this is the bottom plate of the motor. And the weight of the shaft is on that, and it's turning. You have to get this out, clean it, and you got to make sure it's there. A lot of times, this ball bearing, people don't realize it's in there, it vanishes. And they just don't know it. They put the motor back together, and now you have the shaft riding at the bottom of that bearing cup. Your, your turntable is now sitting lower than it should. Your brake, possibly, is scraping the bottom of the turntable because of it. And everybody's wondering, how did this happen? I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. Because this little tiny ball bearing was not in that little cup. But now you see it's out. And I'm going to clean all that up and make it nice and put new lubrication in there. The other thing is your friction leather. This one's in pretty good shape. There's no issues with it that I can see. It might even have been replaced at the same time the spring was. It's soft. It's lubricated. There's no problems there. It'll leave it alone. Sometimes on HMV motors, you'll find that's a felt. Fine, too, as long as there's enough of it. And it's riding clean uh, on the, uh, the disc of the governor there. It's not coming apart. No problem. You, you can leave that. And the shaft that it's on, you see that shaft? over. Oops, don't get, don't lose the, the ball bearing tried to migrate. It's there though. That's why we work in a dish. This shaft, this shaft likes to freeze. It'll freeze in place because this machine, say, hasn't been played in 80 years or so. It'll freeze up there. You don't realize it and you're wondering, why can't I set the speed on this thing? Well, that's because the shaft is frozen in one spot. It will not move. You got to lubricate that up. It's got a spring on it, but it doesn't stop it from freezing. That old-fashioned lubrication is really, really good at turning to cement over time. So you want to make sure that's all nice and lubed up when you're playing with it. I already got the brass gear back on here. That's in good shape. Everything else is fine there. When you clean the motor, get a pick. This is a pick, one style. This, they usually come in sets of four or five and different angles, of you know, so you can make different angles of attack with them. Get... In here, right in the groove, gently. Don't dig into the metal, especially if it's brass. But get in there and get out the old grease deposits. You don't want to leave that in there. And oftentimes, you know, the gas or whatever you're using to scrub the whole motor when you clean it is not going to do the job because these, these are like glue in there. You have to pick them out. It is time-consuming. It could take hours on some motors. This one's not that big, probably because it was cleaned before, but... You have to get in there and get that out, because what that does is it will act like a lapping compound. It collect, That is old grease that's got particles of dust and who knows what mixed in with it, turning it into a wonderful lapping compound that's now going to start to wear your gears. So you got to get that out of there, because the new lubrication will slightly soften it, turn it into a nice paste, and then start wearing everything in there. Don't do you don't want that. Gotta get that out of there. You have here, here, here. Not critical here, but you should get it out there too. Here and here. Oh, and this too. <laughs> there. Gotta clean them all. Got to clean them all. Your motor will run better, it will run quieter in some cases. And uh, you're not allowing that old crap in there to start to wear your gears, especially especially that brass gear right there. That's brass. At least it's not a fiber gear. You know, with fiber gears, don't do it to a fiber gear. Don't pick at a fiber gear. Pick at the steel gear that comes in contact with the fiber gear because fiber gears are delicate. You don't want to break a tooth on one because then it's pretty much finished. And a lot of them are not replaceable. So be very, very careful with a fiber gear. I like to run them dry. I don't put lubrication on them at all because we don't know which modern lube will act with that fiber gear to start breaking it down. A little bit of black graphite dust, it, yeah, it does come in a powder. A little bit of that black graphite powder on there is really all I like to put on a fiber gear. Brass gears, both Victor and HMV use them, fine. You know, the, uh, the Swiss motors, the, the, the Heinemans they use, and uh, Garrard too. They use some form of fiber in there. Sometimes it's brass and fiber sandwich of a gear. Sometimes it's all fiber, like on the Swiss motors. Be very, very careful with that gear. It cannot be replaced except by getting a parts motor or something like that. I don't know of anybody who's manufacturing them. Be nice if they were, but I, I, I can understand why not. There's really not a huge demand for them, I guess. 
uh, to make it worthwhile to tool up to make them again. There's just a few little observations I'm going through. I also found a missing lock washer. Yes, being the 1927 to 28, this motor uses, let's see, here's all the hardware up here. These are the spacers that go between the motor and the motor board. They have to be there. If you lose one, you have to make sure what you replace it with. They are all the same height. Otherwise, your motor is sitting at an angle. You don't want that. That was the problem I had with the last 101 I did. Now, if you look here, you will see lock washers. It's what these use. They don't use double nuts, although you still could. If you have extra parts and you use a lock washer, use a double nut. And that will hold it in place just like it did for a decade before with, and, and more with the, uh, the Victors and the HMVs. But these ones are using lock washers, and there's only two lock washers there. <coughs> because one was lost and not replaced. And guess which bolt was loose? You got it. That one. Eventually, it would have fallen out, and you have to take the machine apart to fish the nut out of there, if you can find it. Put it all back together again and wonder how that happened. Yeah, unlike the Victor motors, these do not use a felt spacer. They use steel spacers. Just a washer, but it has to be of the right height. This height. And don't substitute thinner ones for the 3 of meter, because then you're going to have trouble with your, your turntable height. And that's critical. It has to be right. Governor. You can see this is just like a Victor Governor. And Victor parts do interchange with these. But if you notice, I don't know if you can see it in there, that... That, uh, that weight is riveted to the spring. Screws on each end to the brass body, but the weight itself is riveted to the spring. That means pretty much it's done when it flies apart. This one's not going. This is in excellent shape. This is a beautiful one. You can rebuild these using a Victor spring and weight kit with the screws. All of this is available, brand new, from the parts suppliers or from a parts motor, if you have a Victor motor kicking around that has them. I've done it before. When necessary, this is just like a Victor Governor. It will interchange directly with a Victor Governor. I've used Victor Governors, if there's other problems with these, to fix these motors before. No problem at all. Everything's the same, except that weight and that rivet right there. So if you have to get one, and replace them in threes. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Replace them in threes. If you're going to put one new spring on, put three new springs on, so everything is the same tension. It'll help your speed control. It'll keep everything good and working well. Nothing's going to be overstressed. So you And be careful with these little screws there. Be careful with them because this is a brass body and a tiny little screw. You want to snug them. Don't over-tighten them. Don't over-tighten them. And this little screw right here, you see that one in the middle there? That's what holds the shaft, this part, to the brass body, this part. They like to get loose. This one wasn't, but they do get loose sometimes. Just make sure you check it and make sure it's snugged on there and it's okay. The other thing, freedom of movement of the shaft. See how that moves? The shaft moves right there. This piece and this piece, the shaft in it. This shaft is secured to the top piece, not the bottom piece. It needs to move. When you're spinning up to speed, these weights will move out like that as the, as the governor's spinning controlling your speed, and this disc will ride on the friction leather. Now, I have seen some where this shaft was completely frozen in there. It can happen just like it happened with that shaft. So you want to make sure that's freed up, and if it's not, take this all apart and clean everything, which you should do anyway. And I'm going to be pulling the shaft on this to make sure everything in there, there's no green crap down in there that might bind it up in the future. When that, that's your governor, and this is, this is a critical part of the motor. You need to have that right. You know, you don't want to have a, a problem there. And here we go. This is a spring barrel, which is a typical spring barrel used on the 410s and, and so on. This one's easy to work with for a lot of people because it has the four screws instead of the lock ring. Sometimes a lock ring can be a pain in the neck. You find them on the later 101s, you find them on the 102s, and you the, the Model 59 motor, and the 102s motor, and uh, you find them on all the Victors made after, let's see, oh, I'm going to say 1915 and up. Lock ring holding the top of the barrel on. Now, yeah, they can be a pain to get back on there. There's a reason for this. They're tight so they don't come loose when that motor is spinning. I have seen so many where somebody trimmed them up to get them to fit easier. And yeah, they're kind of holding, but maybe one day they won't. 
So then I have to go sourcing one for my parts pile that's still tight, hasn't been messed with, and then I got to struggle to get it on there. So we know you get a feel for it after a while, but it can be a pain in the neck until it finally snaps in. And when it does, I peen the edges over of the barrel just a little bit to make sure it stays in there. That is critical. You don't want that falling out when your motor's running or, you know, you're, you're cranking it or anything like that because then it's going to get jammed up in there and it could cause damage. So if you have one of the motors with a locking ring, put up with the struggle. Don't give in to temptation to make it easier. There's a reason for its tightness. It's important. And if you have one that is suspiciously loose, that's probably because somebody screwed around with it. They snipped a little bit off to make it easier to go on there. Now you're going to have to either source one from the parts suppliers, get a parts motor, or, and hope it has a good one, or you're going to have to just keep a close eye on it. That's all. But with this motor, the 410, you don't have to worry about that. That's just the four screws. You're going to make, the, make sure the screws are snug and all four screws are there. I've had a few where they stripped out a screw, and instead of properly fixing the threads, they just kind of omitted that screw. And then i got to go hunting around for something to fit it. You know, there's a reason why all four screws need to be there is so that the grease and the oil inside that barrel stay in there. If there's a little gap, it's going to start oozing out every time you crank. You don't want that. Then you lose all your lubrication eventually, and you're back to square one. You're cleaning the whole motor again and doing everything over, maybe even breaking a spring. So you want to be careful with that. Now, uh, what else do we want to cover that sometimes miss? Yes, this. <laughs> I'm going to watch out for that little bearing there. This piece comes apart. This piece has a lock ring on it. See the lock ring? Okay. You just gently pry it off with a screwdriver, flat blade screwdriver, a small one. Don't get... And put a rag over that when you do it. Put a rag over it, stick the screwdriver in there, pry up on the edge. Because that will fly and disappear forever if you allow it. And then once that happens, this... Oh, take the screw off here. That's your non-return spring. See it in there? That's your non-return spring. Tap it a little bit with a wood mallet. It'll start to come out. Put the winding handle in there, screwed in, and just pull it out. Watch out for little washers in here. There's one, sometimes two. Make sure you put them back when you take them out. They're there for a reason. This needs to be properly spaced. Clean this. Put it back in. You can squeeze some fresh grease through here and here and here. Wind it around. Squeeze some more grease in there. Wind it around. A little bit of drop of two of oil, and you're good. That just makes it easier when it comes time to crank these things. They're not all gummed up in there. They're rarely a problem, but you want to clean it anyway while you have it apart. All right, I think that pretty much covers all I wanted to cover today on the 410 motor. And what I've just told you goes for all of the HMV portable motors and most motors in general. You know, but uh, this is a variation of the same motor used on every single HMV portable and Electrola. After, uh, when, when did they start with the 100? I think it was 1925 or late 24 with the 100, which had this, this motor in it. So you want to make sure, you know, when you do it, any of those motors, you pay attention to the little things I've told you about. Because other than the, the shape and the, maybe the length of the spring, they're pretty much all the same motors with the same types of parts and the same type of issues that show up. So that's all. Figured I'd cover that while I had this apart.